Okay, Cambridge students, this is Mr. Forgio, and this is kind of a test run of our first little YouTube video uh, to try to help out during the coronavirus situation, try to get you guys a little bit of review content uh, for some of you. For uh, another class where we still had some presentations, this may actually be new material for you. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what our next unit's about, which is uh, free trade and protectionism. This is much more of a conceptual unit than uh, the last couple have been. So there's not as much math here. It's actually going to be a lot more uh, concept and really persuasive uh, arguments taking a position on something. So the main, uh, the main two points of view that we're talking about here, free trade protectionism, this is how two countries, how different countries' economies are going to relate to one another. So the first thing I want to define real quick is this concept of protectionism. Protectionism, a lot of people think, means isolationism. That's actually not what it's, it's saying. When we're isolationist, that's kind of what we're thinking about right now with the coronavirus, right? We're at home. We're not really dealing with anybody else. Uh, we're kind of doing our own thing. If we're talking about it from an economic perspective, isolationism is basically where a country tries to be self-sufficient. A country tries to do everything on their own manufacturing, services, all of that, and not actually trading with other groups. That's not really what protectionism is about. Protectionism is actually saying we're only going to trade in very specific situations where it benefits us. They're not saying that they're not going to ever trade. They're only saying, hey, we're only going to trade in situations that uh, it benefits us, not necessarily uh, other countries versus free trade is essentially we're saying uh, we're not going to put any sort of tariffs, any sort of uh, tactics up that could limit trade. We want what grows the economy for everybody, including ourselves. Now, whichever side that you're on of, of these two, uh, it's totally fine. There's, there's not a right or a wrong per se, but we need to take a look at the, t the style of arguments that these two are going to have. Protectionism is going to be much more, more of the arguments here are going to be from a uh, moral standpoint. There's a couple of economic arguments that we'll get into, but most of your arguments over here on protectionism, much more from a moral standpoint. Here on free trade, most of them are looking at this from a purely economic standpoint. Now, the reason I bring that up, Cambridge loves to throw on a free response uh, to display the, uh, the best economic arguments of protectionism, and they'll trip you up a little bit with that. Uh, because you'll, you'll be talking about certain moral arguments that we'll get into and you actually don't get credit there. So you want to pay specific attention to whether they're talking moral or whether they're talking economic arguments. So I'm just going to talk a little bit today uh, about the, the free trade arguments, just a couple of them, uh, since this is kind of a test run and you guys can kind of give me comments on the bottom and, and, and let me know what worked and what didn't here. But on the free trade side, uh, the first thing you're probably thinking of is, okay, we talked way back beginning of the year that uh, trade is one of the ways that our PPF extends out. It's one of the ways, along with technology and more resources, that we can actually get more of everything, specialization and trade. And that's true here as well. Um, free trade typically leads to economic growth. And within that, also a greater standard of living higher standard of living. Uh, so that is going to be obviously uh, a major point of impact for free trade. It's going to be a major positive here. Now another positive, and this is one that you absolutely have to talk about. If you get an FRQ on this, which I think is fairly likely, this is something that you do have to talk about, which is competition. When you're allowing other countries to come into a domestic market, you're essentially bringing in different firms, you're allowing those firms to compete. And what competition does is it leads to lower prices and it leads to higher quality. Now I know usually when we use that Q, we're talking about quantity and, and we'll get to that at a later point. But essentially here what we're talking about is quality, not quantity. So as an example, if you were to go into Publix, not for toilet paper, but for actual your regular grocery stop, shopping, when you go in that uh, the cooler by the deli and they've got all these different meats and cheeses and all that, 
Some of those are going to be domestic. Some of those are, are made here in the U.S. from different uh, dairy farms and things like that. But a lot of them are imported. A lot of them are coming from places like Italy, uh, Switzerland, France. We see a lot of these different meats and cheeses coming from those places. Now, with that, what, what that forces uh, other companies to do is, number one, they're going to have to uh, figure out what their, what their market is, what their niche market is. But it's going to force them to try to be competitive price-wise, where they're going to lose out. If, if, if uh, domestic companies' prices are way higher than all of the uh, imported companies, the imported firms, they're going to lose out. They're not going to be staying in business very long. Also, uh, it's going to force our domestic firms to up their game a little bit, to up their quality. If you are able to get your hands on uh, other firms, on other meats, other cheeses that are at a uh, that, that are really better quality, and if they're at a reasonable price, okay, domestic companies are going to have to get better. They're going to have to up their game. Uh, examples on this, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, the Japanese car companies, particularly Toyota and Honda, were so much more dependable than American car companies at that point. Uh, and so people, the domestic consumers, start switching uh, from driving Fords and Chevys over to driving uh, Hondas and Toyotas. What that did was it forced the domestic car companies to up their game. And what we've seen now over the last 10 years is Fords, General Motors, uh, they're, they're starting to get better in terms of their durability, their dependability. We're seeing American car companies sort of having to step up their game a little bit because of this competition. Now, these are certainly not the only two uh, free trade arguments, but I want to leave off there for right now since this is just a test video. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Please comment on the bottom. Let me know if this worked, if this didn't work, and, and we'll kind of adjust as we go from there. Thanks a lot.